Hello and welcome to our offstage, ac uh, offstage action for this year's Republica. We are a team of students and we produced a project in the last weeks, the Deepfake Report. Today we want to talk about how synthetic media will shape the future of journalism for good. We are happy that you are all here and if you have some comments, if you have some questions, just ask in our channels, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you like. And I want to present you the yeah, the leaders of this project, <laughs> the speakers for tonight. So we have Sebastian May, um, he's a trainee at Axel Springer Academy and actually working for Welt TV. And he was kind of the, yeah, we could say head of literacy of our project, uh, one of the main persons for the literacy part. So thank you very much, Basti, nice that you're here. Nice to be here. <laughs> and we have Katharina Safariri, your student at Code University and yes. also trainee at Axel Springer. And you were like the head of our tech um, perspective in our project. So nice that you're here as well. Thank and you. first in the beginning, we want to show you a little bit about our project. Um, as I told you in the last week, we produced a very huge project about the topic deepfakes and which chances, challenges and danger is in deepfakes. We created a website and also a documentary, which is like 25 minutes long. And in this documentary, we created deepfakes in just four weeks. And we did some fun with politicians. We showed them their own deepfakes to see their reaction. And now we can see the trailer. Das könnte sowohl meine Existenz ruinieren als auch, wie gesagt, meine Position in der Partei massiv schwächen. Wenn man in einer Gesellschaft keinen Konsens mehr darüber hat, was eigentlich ist, was passiert ist, was die Realität ist, dann hat man auch mit der Demokratie und dem Rechtsstaat einfach ein massives Problem. You could actually do whatever you want with my voice and my face. And I completely have no control on that. Problematik ist, dass man so einen Deepfake, was einmal verbreitet worden ist, kaum noch wieder aus dem Netz herausbekommt. So, that was our trailer to our documentary. As you could see, there was, uh, for example, politician Wolfgang Kubicki and also uh, Konstantin von Notz. We deepfaked them and showed them the deepfakes. So, Sebastian, I want to ask you, how was it for you to make this documentary, to make this project? Yeah, well, to be honest, it was quite the adventure <laughs> um, because um, when, we, when we first came up with the topic, um, it was really like... Um, we didn't really know much about it. We just knew these news reports, and because, like you know, we we are working in journalism, so we read a lot of news, and um, most of the news that we read were, was like, our oh, deep fates are going to destroy our democracy. Um, they're going to kill us probably, <laughs> and we're like, okay, this is going to be like a really, really amazing topic. And there was also this idea that um, you know. When you hear the word deepfake and you hear what is possible and you see these examples, there's, there's like some, some film going on in your head. And this was, this was kind of amazing. But as we will discuss later probably, um, we had like some slight mindset changes probably um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the piece. But yeah, it was, it was nice. Yeah, and also Katharina, as I mentioned, you're a student at the Code University. I yeah. mean, that was actually the first project as our Free Tech Academy. True. So like the conclusion or like the come together between techs and journalists. Mm -hmm. So I think we were a team of 29 people, um, techs and journalists together. How was it for you from the tech perspective to, to make this project? I mean, it was also from our perspective quite, quite a challenge um, in terms of well, de delving into the technology, finding out what is possible. Um, we did some pre-tests before the actual project started. Um, the issue there was that we couldn't really anticipate where the entire project would go. So based on what we saw in the pre-test, we weren't necessarily always, well, sure if we would be able to produce um, the highest quality of deepfakes. We were sure we would produce something in the end, um, but yeah, that was kind of, I think, the friction on our end. And then as we progressed into the project, we saw we had different issues uh, arising at every 
point and every turn basically but i feel this is more the development process itself because it's very iterative and what we saw also is we fundamentally work differently from journalists mm -hmm. so you see there like two worlds clashing together like for sure totally another workflow for something sure. like that how was it um i think we mainly had a problem about the language as well because it is easier to produce english deepfakes yeah and we wanted to do them in german because of german politicians and our testimonials i mean how can you describe what was the problem actually with the german language yeah so basically deep learning was used or is the fundamental underlying technology for um, deep fakes and the issue there is if you basically have to imagine it in a way that you are teaching a child to speak a certain language um, the models that are trained though that are out there that are open source available are all trained on the english language um, and the interesting other thing is that there is a lot of like variance also in language so in order to basically emulate german for example like cohesively and um well yeah in a, in a way that it actually sounds like the people you want to basically emu emulate um the issue there is well it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of data and a lot of relevant data as well um, and I think you all saw it, we all saw it uh, throughout this project, how much data actually goes into creating a synthetic voice, for example. Hmm. We can also have a look on our website now um, to see we didn't also create just a documentary about this project, but also a very informative website. Uh, we will show also the history of deepfakes, how easy and how hard it is to detect them. And um, also a short view in the future, <laughs> I think you can say that. Um, we had some scenarios in the future um, to show, okay, how important are deepfakes, how important could be deepfakes for the media, for the society, for politicians, for VIPs, so like for all the society stuff. And I would say we will start with the talk. Um, and I think basically the first question for everybody who's maybe not interested into deepfakes, what is the special thing about deepfakes? Why do deepfakes exist? Yeah, um, so this is an interesting topic because that was basically the first question that we asked most of our interviewees that we had. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it sounds easy, um, but there, there, is, there are different aspects to it. Um, so as Katarina will probably tell you, um, deepfakes are a natural uh, development in the, technolo in the in technological field. So this is the technological aspect. Um, you, can, you can go further into that. Um, from the journalistic standpoint, um, deep fakes um, have, a, they have a huge news value because they are something new. They, they create something that, that was always like an imagination that we had. We always like, you know, uh, Frankenstein, the book. Like, this is like an early example of um, people creating other people and we're like, okay, look, we, we, created, some, we created something new. Mm -hmm. And I think the deep fakes are a bit in this, uh, in this history. So deepfakes are something that you can create um, out of another person, and this sparks yeah, some some ideas in our head when just when we think about it. And I think this is where the interest comes in. And I think this is why deepfakes are, yeah, yeah. I, I think this this is why deepfakes exist, probably. Mm -hmm. in a so you saw it from a very, yeah, like maybe from a very scientific pers uh, perspective. What is the tech perspective saying? <laughs> are they saying the same? Okay. It goes pretty much into the same direction, although it's complementary in some sort of way. So um, from our perspective, they exist because they can exist now, um, because it's technologically feasible, because we um, have these advancements in artificial intelligence, especially in the subfield called deep learning. And the interesting thing is that it's actually imitating life there. Um, basically the way you can imagine these um, this to work is um, how the brain works and how the brain cells are working in order to compute one thing so you're emulating different strands of brain, brain nerves um, and all of them together are basically the computing power of the brain so that's I think very um, well in a complex uh, setting complex way put together what deep learning actually does and um, 
The other aspect is, I mean, we can talk about why they exist in a lot of different perspectives, but another one is basically like from a moral perspective, which is interesting, also from a technological side. Um, why do they exist open source, for example? Because a lot of these technologies are basically developed, of course, by the giant tech companies that are out there. Um, but there is a lot of code out there on GitHub, basically, that you can uh, pull and um, work with. Um, and why are they open source there? Why has sort of deep fake emerged uh, as something where you swap, for example, faces um, in, onto a target video? Um, so. Yeah, from a, from a moral perspective, it's very interesting to sort of reflect, okay, um, has that perhaps also something to do with like ego there, like pushing this out onto the world and showing, well, look, um, I was a developer and I developed this. Um, perhaps it's another aspect. So yeah, I think there there is a multiplicity of sort of arguments that we can now bring forward why deepfakes exist in the first place. I'm wondering, do you think it's a bad thing, um, this ego thing that you mentioned, that people try to boost their ego by by yeah, by contributing to, to such a new field? Well, I mean, in some sort of way, um, it's... The, part of the discussion of like what's arrogant and what's confidence and I feel if you if you are arrogant about certain things like as a normal human being for example then um, in the end it will be perceived negatively um, so I think actions have like both sides I, I guess I'm not very fond of the fact that people do it out of like egoistic sort of uh, out of their ego basically um, and perhaps a way to mitigate this is to have some sort of which we don't currently um, like a Hippocratic oath um, which developers would um, sort of reframe and put it as a code of conduct for developers basically um, to basically when you launch this onto the world um, always sort of reflect on what that means um, because we are not like in an isolated bubble and as developers and potentially can erode also like democracies with what we do. But <laughs> I'm wondering, because we had this discussion yeah. as well in, in the group um, when, when, we, when we wrote the articles, for example, um, we, we, we felt that um, knowing that something could be a deep fake, and there were a lot of experts that we spoke to that, that said the same thing, yeah. that um, knowing that something could be a deep fake is at the moment more dangerous than deep fakes. Yeah. Because you can, like, when, when, you, when you really want to know if it's a deep fake, you can see it. I mean, there are the Tom Cruise deep fakes or, or something, but um, knowing that there could be a deep fake is, um, is potentially dangerous. And I'm wondering, like, um, this moral aspect that you mentioned, yeah. um, now, this, now this technology is out there and now these thoughts are out there. And, um, you know, the, the people that, that created these defects in the first place um, or um, yeah, maybe not created them, but put them out there, uh, open source. Yeah. I'm wondering, like, these people, um, yeah, I, mean, I really want to speak to some of them, but they, they never replied. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, um, they started some kind of movement and some kind of also like some, yeah. some, some way of democratizing as well. So they are like yes. this, like this, I think that that's one, one, one big thing about, about this whole topic. It is not a black and white. And this is something that, that I mentioned, sure. that, that I've seen in journalism as well, what I mentioned in the beginning, that um, I, I don't want to say deepfakes are, are like <laughs> sent by heaven or something. Deepfakes have been like really, really bad potential as well, yeah. um, of course. Um, but I'm wondering when, when, we, when we speak about deepfakes, um, we always speak about the, the the, uh, yeah, the the disruption of democracies and stuff, and of course this could happen, but yeah. um, deepfakes are just another layer, and we have we have to think about it in this way. I think we have to think about that this is some 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 new form of disinformation, um, but also some new form of creating content, and yeah. that's the way we have to we have to view it uh, in, in media and journalism. But um, I don't know how it's in tech, how how you should view it then. I mean, we always go from a certain hype cycle into um, well, down the hype cycle and being a bit more sober about technology um, and I think we also went through this process because the underlying technology is like 
astounding. It's very fascinating, and working with it is very cool and complex. Um, but then also, again, it isn't because you can just pull it from the internet. So um, as you were saying, it's not always black and white. So we probably started off at the edge of being like, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing ever, and moved closer to the middle and thinking, well, actually, it is quite harmful. Um, and if we think about like, what are the first deep fakes that emerged? They emerged as deep nudes. They emerged in, um, well, basically a field which goes like deep into our privacy and um, potentially any one of us could be deep faked, which is also another thing when you're s sitting there, you're like, hmm, okay, like I'm all for open source, um, but if we do this open source, then we need some sort of guidelines, um, ethical guidelines, like what's morally right to do. Uh, and I feel we're still lacking this in, in the technological sphere. But who would decide what is right and what is wrong? Well, field? I mean, yeah, uh, we, need, we need different people from different disciplines to work on, in on this because you can't do this isolated. Again, like bubbles don't work. And I think it was so valuable also that we were doing this in an interdisciplinary project because we constantly had to reflect on each other's sort of perspectives. And the same also goes for this kind of like um, code of developers or a code of conduct or whatever you would say um, or call it basically. Um, but what we would need is different people from different disciplines, uh, also philosophers that will discuss this and will define it together with us because developers are the ones that are building this technology, but the consequences are a lot broader than they actually ever think about when they're building this technology. So I think, yeah, could be an interesting thought to nurture. <laughs> so it's like in every tech topic, I mean, it's not a technology which is a problem, it's the person which is a problem and who can, yeah, misuse uh, the technology as well. So let's head over question to this question and um, I mean how yeah how how critical is it that a person who is like um, a terrorist for example or like a hacker um, how yeah how has journalists be careful about this problem Sebastian yeah so first uh, I think it's really um uh, some kind of inappropriate to mention like terrorists and haters in <laughs> the same sense. <laughs> but they can use it, but, for example. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, <laughs> the, the thing about deep fakes is that um, what, what um, the, the thought that uh, people think about when, when, when they say it's dangerous is um, not because people with a high tech background can create them, but because they think that um, um, my mother can create them, <laughs> so uh, or one day create them, and that's that's the potentially uh, dangerous thing, and that's the also the potentially um, amazing thing. Mm. So that that's that's where the, that's where the, the the conflict is basically. Um, it's it's not the high tech people; it's it's the it's the normal people, the the creatives uh, who want to use it. But yeah, back to your question. Um, um, so journalism, yeah. I think deep fakes um, have have like a lot of uh, could have and will have probably um, some sort of impact in journalism in, in short in short span, but they will have a, like a really big probably um, impact on the long run, in the long term, because um, in the way we um, we we can use it to produce more fake um, to produce more um, content. For example, there there is this um, idea that you could, for example, when you when you watch soccer games or, or um, football or something. And um, you, have, you have like 15 people in Germany who want to watch the Indian uh, Super League. I don't know. I don't know how it's called. Um, that you can then use um, like an artificial voice or an artificial um, person that that, that can um, speak or that, that can be seen and, and comment um, and can be yeah, speaking about the game. That's that's one aspect. But on the other hand, there is also the the, the danger, of course, of fake news, um, of disinformation. This is this is like the obvious obvious cause. And um, that, that's a really interesting thing because I think what's really important and the, the EU with their new um, regulatory framework they, they proposed, the EU Commission, um, it targets exactly that. So you have to mention it's a deep fake. And um, I think the problem is not in journalism when it comes to producing deep fakes because we will always mention it's a deep fake. Mm -hmm. The problem is when it comes to um, verification of deep fakes, of audio deep fakes. That's where it gets tricky because now at the moment, um, um, you, you can still sort of see when amateur produces deepfakes. That's that's obvious. But um, 
in, in the near future, that's going to be a bit more difficult. I mean, for example, we had that example of Tom Cruise uh, on TikTok, the 50-second videos, and all the media said, okay, hey, that could be Tom Cruise. I mean, this is like, okay, it was blasting in all the boulevard media uh, all around the world. So, Katarina, what do you think, what is the main challenge for journalism to deal with deepfakes? Well, I think um, Sebastian already pointed to where it's, well, how do we actually know that a source is credible? Um, and I know there is like a certain uh, way of conduct of how you verify videos in journalism, but even these, like in the end, I think media companies will have to have um, detection softwares to run videos through to see if um, basically it's faked or not. But this is just one layer of the puzzle because detection software is always kind of in a cat and mouse kind of race with uh, the deep fakes because the better the detection software gets, the better the algorithms get um, basically that create the deep fakes. So you're always going to have to, um, well, basically fight this development um, in, in detection software. So. Another layer that we will 100% need are provenance solutions. And that means we need a way to um, basically locate um, where the origin is from through metadata, for example, which is stored on the blockchain. It's, it's one of the many ideas out there. And another one is uh, alibi log services for politicians because, um, well, at the moment you need a lot of data and even that is not true anymore because there are a lot of models out there which can be trained just on a couple of split seconds of videos so if you have enough time enough money um, you can basically produce something out there um, so the the question again is okay how do we verify that a politician is at that particular location there at home for example And that's where these live log services would come into play. They're like a huge violation of privacy, to be honest, um, because they would basically log your location, like your movements, for example, could be one of them. Um, but maybe this would be something that comes then with the job of a politician in the near future. Um, so yeah, I hope we're gonna uh, develop provenance also um, from the device side so in terms of like that uh, device providers already will have this imbued um, or it will already be in operational systems but um, yeah there is like I see at the moment it's like a very slow development because I feel as humans we are sometimes a bit slow to to actually see uh, the value of doing this for example um, yeah so that are like two of the main factors that uh, will aid in this. And then, of course, regulatory um, is always one of the levers that you have to pull, basically, like some sort of um, regulatory framework. And I think we need one which goes, which is um, global and not just from country to country, because this is on the Internet. And um, the Internet doesn't really have like a country um, or isn't location specific it's like a global place so I think like similar to a Paris Accord we need some sort of like um, online safety misconduct um, accord which sort of mitigates um, on a very global level basically mm -hmm. so I think that's very interesting what you mentioned because um, um, we are at a stage right now with this technology, um, or as, um, as far as we've researched at least. <laughs> Maybe there is someone out there who's creating like these crazy deep fakes and doesn't show them yet. <laughs> but um, we, are, we are on a, a stage right now um, that, that we are exactly at this point where we need to discuss it. Because now yeah. um, we, can, we still can discuss it, because there, there are a lot of deep fakes videos, but they are, they are mostly used for fun, for sat satire. But, they, but you can also already see the negative impact that it can have. Yeah. And when you, when you imagine, just as I said earlier, that um, in the near future or in like five to ten years, there could be like perfect deep fates made from a phone. That is something that you have to be aware of, and that is something that you have to um, that you have to educate now and not in five to ten years because then it's too late. The, the thing is, you will probably not be able to do it mm. because um, you know. Um, when, I, when, I say, when I say to you now, oh, Flo, you know, in, in five to ten years, there's going to be a big asteroid hitting the Earth. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, it's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I won't believe Shut it. Yeah. yeah, you won't believe it. <laughs> But um, I think a real, a, real, um, a real important trigger is to show it. 
Um, so, so you have to show what is possible now. You have to show what is possible in five to ten years. You can't show what is possible in five to ten years, but you can, yeah. Imagine. There are examples. You can imagine, yeah. So I think that that's where we wanted to yeah. head with the with the project as well, because you know it's also um, it sounds it sounds strange, but it's also a big chance for journalism that uh, deep fakes will exist because um, people will want to trust something. Um, you you will want um, you want you want to consume information that you trust that that you that you that you that you think that that you, that you think that this information is true, but where do you get this information from? Mm. Uh, at the moment, for a lot of people, it's social media, and that's exactly the point. Because on social media now, there is a lot of disinformation, and people believe it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest questions for journalism is how do you get the people that are not yet in this disinformation bubble um, to not step into this disinformation bubble by deep fakes or something? Mm -hmm. So this is a journalistic question. So how do you establish yourself as a trusted brand or something, um, and um, to to show the people, okay, look. You, you can look on social media, um, but there is the danger of, of photoshopped images already. Um, there is the danger of um, um, out of context videos, which is already there as well. And now there's the danger of deep fakes. Um, and but when when you go to our website, it's going to be fine, basically. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's it's a utopia. But that would be um, like at least a mindset that, that you have to, to think about. Can I tie in into this? I think one additional aspect, um, which I think you already touched upon, but. I just want to clarify because this is like if there is something to take away aside from awareness about deepfakes, it's accountabilities. Um, so we need to really, really define like who is accountable for which step right now. So in terms of like detection software, well, it won't be the normal non-developer individual that will be building this, but it will be developers that will be building this. So we need developers that are building it. And likewise, we need politicians that are funding these things. And I know the digital ministries, for example, in Germany are doing this. But again, we don't just need like one company working on this. We need multiple ones. Um, and then the same for provenance solutions. It's on the developer side. But we also have a lot of like individual action to take. So in terms of like we always use the internet a bit of like blasting everything in our lives out there and not really thinking about the consequences and perhaps now is some sort of time to start thinking about it um, not in terms of like we can still do all this blasting out there but like where is the data kept and is it safe from like being pulled for example um, and that's one of the things. And the other one is also uh, companies need to take action right now because, as you were saying, we're at the point where we can still react to it. Um, so I think um, these are kind of like a couple of accountabilities. And then there is more, like governments also need to take action um, to mitigate it. And I know action in the political sphere takes a lot of time. Perhaps it makes sense to start thinking about it right now. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Sebastian... How do you think, how are media companies responsible for this? You told us about the um, bubble on Instagram or like on social media, uh, the bubble of misinformation, the bubble of fake news there. How are companies responsible to be aware of this and also to say, okay, on our website you will not see fake news or like misinformation? Yeah, so I think... Um Actually, for, for media companies, that shouldn't be too big of a, of a step because we already, um, I'm speaking of we, but I'm just a twin year there. <laughs> but, you know, um, we, we, are, we are already speaking about disinformation and misinformation. We are already speaking about, um, you know, how can we trust this? Like, we are already um, asking, um, where, where, did this, where did this guy get this picture from? Like, <laughs> could, could this be real? Uh, so you're already doing it. And it's just the next step. It's um, but when 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 this technology arises and uh, that's more common, which it will be, like it, it will be more common, um, then um, you have you have to communicate it. And that's the important thing, because um, we as journalists and that's that's big words now. But we as journalists, I think we can handle some sort of misinformation um, because of how we because of how we work, because we look at information the whole day. But the the typical consumer um, that just scrolls through, uh, through social media, as I said, that mm. he he or she cannot do this. So that's where journalism needs to communicate more, and be more like this trusted thing, and not like this. Um, you know, a lot of this, as I mentioned also in the beginning, it's it's about opinion. It's about um, 
um, deep faiths are bad. Um, I, I mentioned that yesterday when we spoke about uh, this this talk today. Uh, I mentioned to Katarina that um, when 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 I read an article about deep faiths, it's always in the beginning deep faiths are bad. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like um, there could be this deep faith, but deep yeah. faiths are bad. Uh, problem for the democracy. Yeah, problem, or problem yeah. for society. Yeah. And, and of course, that that, that that could be true, but mm. um, that's already. Um, inflicting an opinion on this topic mm. and um, that is just a small example of how we could handle this like of how of how trust gets maybe pulled away a bit because when you mention this technology is bad and people see it on social media and they're like oh come on this is fun I, I can use it <laughs> then people are like okay maybe there's something fishy about this company because they're always warning you know like 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 um, when you're a small child and um, you, you want to try the, the, the chocolate on the table and your mother always says, no, don't try the chocolate. <laughs> and you're like, okay, yeah, man, it, must be, it must be great. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> I think that, that's, that's where we need to communicate more. We need to um, elaborate more on what it is. And it's also where tech park comes in. Um, yeah. We need to show more what it can do. And we need to also show some good examples. Um, and there are some good examples. There are like some museums that they used uh, Salvador Dali um, mm -hmm. and, um, made, made out of an AI um, deep learning algorithm and that's amazing and uh, we need to show this and um, I just saw an article yesterday in the video where there was um, there was this um, lip sync um, face swap thingy going on in the movie and it, it, it was everywhere and people liked it mm -hmm. and I think that that's the first step to really build trust in this technology and therefore build trust also in the people that, communi that communicate this technology so as the journalists mm. basically yeah and I think another so looking at it from the other side like from the technology from the technological side basically we need to up our game in terms of like explaining also these technologies a lot better um i feel i know like we talked about this um also a lot but i feel because we are in this bubble and we always talk about people that are in the same field we sometimes miss to inform people that are not within uh, the technological sphere what is going on. And it's groundbreaking what's happening, but we also need to break it down, uh, break it down in terms of like explain it a lot better, like what are the processes that are happening. Um, and, and then from there, basically, um, well, and that's maybe something we can learn from journalists, create a lot better storytelling. And that already also starts with naming things in this sphere. Deep fakes is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think about it, well, it has fake in it. Um, so what good is going to come out of it? You're not going to say like something like super positive about it. So perhaps we also need to start reframing. And if we're naming technologies, naming them intentionally. So you're like uh, pro synthetic media and not deep fakes because synthetic media sounds more neutral. Exactly. And it is exactly... Yeah, what we discussed. I mean, in the last days, for me, example, um, I had a report the last days about the football game FIFA 21 on the PlayStation, and actually they brought a boy into this game who was murdered 15 years ago, and now actually he's he should be 30 years old, but he passed away, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and now he's in the game, so you can play him for uh, an English second, uh, second league uh, uh, team, so that's amazing, I think, and that's yeah. a really good point for deepfakes. But let's, over, let's head over to our yeah, like main question uh, we ask. I mean, how will deepfakes or synthetic media uh, shape the journalism for good? That's the question, Sebastian. Yeah, I think we touched um, we touched on that a lot <laughs> in the last uh, last few, uh, last few answers. But yeah, so um, as I mentioned, it's it's a trust aspect, of course. Um, it, it gives a possibility to um, to to show them we are we are like your saviors, basically. That that's not that's not the way journalism should be. We should not be like the, we are we are saving you from the bad information, but we should be just like the. You know, when you go into a bar and um, there are like these drunk people on the sides, and, mm -hmm. and you see one guy in the back, and he's like, oh, he's like this 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 guy who always tells you, man, you have you have some toothpaste on your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it should be journalism. So, yeah. you know, you know what I mean. At least like from my standpoint, at least from my standpoint. And um, another big chance is, um, you know, this this technology will change the way we we create content. And instead of um, what is what is happening, what, what has happened a lot when we look back in the future of content creation, when you had like the first like user generated content, there were people who were like, "Oh, this is amazing! We can see people um, creating creating videos um, all by themselves. It's amazing! Look at this!" And we can be um, at places we 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 can't we couldn't have been before, like at um, airplane crashes. You can see people with phones 
nowadays. Mm. And I think um, um, in an interview, a person, um, I just don't want to name them, but uh, they said something really interesting. They said, um, now, like when, when this whole user-generated content came out, people were out with their phones and filming stuff. Mm. And you were like, oh, this is amazing. But now the people wouldn't even need to go out anymore. They could, they could still create amazing content, which would be newsworthy, um, which, which would have been created from their homes, um, like sitting back on the couch and just creating a deepfake. I think that's something really cool, also something really dystopian in a way, because as I mentioned, it's, uh, you, you can create some, some, some really bad stuff with it. Um, just imagine like a Donald Trump campaign with deepfake, like, pfft, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yes, it's yes. really bad. But I think that that's, that's a really um, interesting aspect when we look at this way. Yeah. I mean, on the, like, if you consider the negative sides of it, for me, I think what we underestimate at the moment is not so much like these big deepfake campaigns, but more the, the subtle um, deepfake changes in, in tonality, for example, in like a couple of words in a video, like subtly changing content in that sort of way that I find will be a lot more dangerous than showing Donald Trump doing something ridiculous because it's so out of context. That's why it's easy to spot. So kind of like these unconscious ones are, are the ones that will potentially be a big risk if we don't start taking action. Um, but yeah, in any case, I think synthetic media, if we think about like how we think, we don't think in text. We think about, we think about images. Some of us think in colors. Some of us think, though, in a film kind of setting. And it will be a big step in producing what we have in our brains, basically, onto onto anything. And I think it will also change how we learn. Like, uh, it won't be text-based anymore. It will be a lot, like, video-based. And I think journalism will also change a lot. Text will probably be secondary um, in, in, I don't know, I can't really predict how long it's going to take, but... Um, Probably not too long um, if I look at how steep this uh, technology is already um, well accelerated from 2017 to now, basically. Well, yeah, let's see how that develops. But I think it's very interesting for a lot of different areas and democratization is like a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, um, as, as I mentioned, um, the, the whole um, moral aspect that you mentioned as well, um, it's really important to know the intention of a deepfake, that, that, uh, like the intention behind a deepfake. So you, you should not ask, um, what is this deepfake? You should ask, why is this deepfake, basically? <laughs> so uh, in regards to your first question. <laughs> so um, um, why, why, why does this deepfake exist? Is this, this, this the real question? Because then, then, uh, then, you, you, then you have the power to decide um, how you want to view it. When, when, you, when you see this, this deepfake is, um, Racist or this deepfake is uh, uh, yeah like deepfake porn which is mm -hmm. uh, huge. Um, then then it's then it's bad. Then then but you should treat it in a bad way. And we did this with images as well. We did it with, with um, bad racist texts as well. Um, I'm not speaking um, towards um, cancel culture. I'm working as well, so cancel culture is a bad word here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, you know. Um, You're just a trainee, yeah, Sebastian. Just trainee, but, <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell it but, to your boss. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, a really important thing is to 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 realize that um, that the intention behind the deepfake is is the most important part, and that we shouldn't be like this technology is bad. No, as as you mentioned as well, it's the intention that makes it bad, and that's also where where truth comes in. Uh, truth is a, is a big word, <laughs> but um, um, intention can be changed. So when someone creates yeah. creates a deepfake, um, I create a deepfake of you or of you, and um, um, I make a funny deepfake where you say, "Oh, Katerina, ha ha ha, uh, look, look at her, ha ha ha," uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, then I, then I use it, and and we are like in our group, we are like, "Oh, it's fine." And then you use it and uh, show it to your friends and they're like, oh, this flow guy, man, he's, he's such he's such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> he, made this, he, made this, uh, he made these bad videos of, of Katarina and you're like, okay, hmm. <laughs> the intention changed. And this is where, where like, as we mentioned, also the, the, like this, the, the, the sort of echo chambers come in. So when you, when you think about deepfakes on a societal level, you have, you have to think about um, the impact that it has on the echo chambers, but also... Um, on a wider scale, and that's what makes deepfakes so interesting. But you mentioned um, that with deepfakes and with the technology, like everybody can produce news and produce uh, their own topics. 
like for example i mean would it mean that this is a complete overload for newsrooms and also for uh, for media companies because you get so many news and actually with all the technology and with the internet for example what we have actually we have so many news in the world and we have to see okay which news are relevant and which are not so when everybody can produce their own uh, um, media and their own informations i mean is this kind of a danger that newsrooms they will see okay we have too much news yeah, but to be honest um, sorry sorry yeah. Yeah. but uh, i mentioned earlier that user generated content and there was the, the like, this is like the same same sort of thing because um, at the moment we don't have um, i can just speak for where i work but um, we don't have the time to verify every to ver verify every content that we see that's not possible and that will not be possible with defects but um, we have um, trusted news agencies, uh, AP, Reuters, DPR, which we can trust at least, which we hope we can trust. Um, and um, they, they are their guys that verify it. So for us, at, at, uh, where I work, it's like, okay, there, there are these videos, but um, we, will, we will trust our sources first. So we will trust our human sources, we will trust the source that we trusted before and that are trusted in general. Yeah. So um, that's 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 the part for journalism. And when you when you see an image like, um, yeah, it's mostly like in breaking news situations when you have um, people storming the capital, mm. um, then then it comes into play and you have to verify it. Mm. But I think we are really careful with it. Um, and when something bad happens, you always you you always like when when you publish a deep fake when you would have published a deep fake of some 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 person storming the capital would um, and, and you would have deep your your yourself your face on one of these guys and we would have published it it would have been really really bad so mm -hmm. we are really really careful with it so. i think it also goes into the direction of well user generated content again creates a lot of data and in the end how do we in a media company also go through all of this and i think again it might also change the way you guys work. Um, you might need to handle a lot more data, which means you might need to gather or get some skills in terms of coding um, to sift through all this data. And it also has the potential to help you verify content. And I'm not sure if, if this has been sort of like discussed in some sort of way already. I'm sorry if I'm iterative on that. But um, the thing is there, you can then also verify by scraping a lot of data from the internet and verifying it from different sort of sources in that sort of way because there is multiplicity of data out there. And if you basically see the same video over and over again um, and not from any sort of different angle, for example, then perhaps it's not so trustworthy. So the interesting thing is, okay, how do we handle this data? And I think data journalism will become something uh, very prominent in the media and publishing industry. It's also really expensive, to be honest, to, to, to like, because, because you need time and uh, a lot of people in journalism don't have time. And then that's a big thing where, where you yeah. guys come in, basically, where you have to help. And I think that was something that was really interesting about our um, work on this project, because we really realized, as you mentioned earlier, how different we work, but also um, how we could uh, emphasize the strength of the other party, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is like, um, deep fates are the perfect example for it, because you need some sort of storytelling to have, an, uh, to have a, yeah, like a credible deepfake, um, but you also need to have the technical skills to, to, to create one. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what is the actual development in the like, near future? What can we expect in the, in the, in the next years? Me first. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think if we think about what's already developing, basically, a lot of content will be created text to video. So you'll be able to type something and a lovely video will be created. Um, how great this is gonna look in the next five years, I don't know, but perhaps in the next 10 years, this will be like one of the big, big advancements within that f sphere. And then also in terms of like, um, it will facilitate communication a lot more because instant translation will happen. So for example, if you have a conference with someone speaking a different language, it could render basically the language onto your face and there would be no language barrier. So that's also potential development there. Um, yeah, and there is a multiplicity of these in, in the entertainment industry. If you think about um, film production, 
CGI has been so costly over the years. I think this is something that is going to change fundamentally, basically. Um, and yeah, a lot of amazing things and a lot of amazing startups are coming out of this sphere. So um, I think this is one of the directions that it could take. Sebastian, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a really hard question, <laughs> uh, to be honest. Um, I think, um, yeah, you mentioned the, the, the technical sides and the, the benefits it could have. Um, um, you know, I was Maybe you can show the dangerous yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, I was <laughs> thinking about it now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, of course, there, there's this utopian vision of it and there's this dystopian f uh, vision of it. And um, I thought, um, yeah, I mentioned earlier how we, how we approached this project. And I think the way we evolved in this project um, is really like is really like a statement for how this whole thing could evolve. <laughs> because when we started the project, we were like, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to fake. Uh, we we're going to create a fake politician. That was our first idea. We were like, let's create a fake politician. And uh, we were even thinking about um, getting him into, into into an election. And, <laughs> and it was something we were like, oh man, this is so crazy. If that was if that would work. But then we got this reality shock. We're like, okay, this is not going to work. <laughs> there is no way we can do it, and it's it's too it's too difficult. We, we can't do it. So this was the first step. And so there was this um, this first barrier that we hit. So then we were like, okay, what else can we do? We, we create some politicians. Uh, we, we create some deep of some politicians. And it was, it was fun. It was, it was interesting. But then we also realized what, what good it could do. Um, you mentioned it. So, um, and then we had like this, this, like this, this broader picture. We had like, um, as I mentioned, the, the fake Instagram influencer politician. Um, we had this... Um, these, these, these deep fates that we created, they were good, but they weren't awesome, but they were okay. And then um, we had this positive sides. And I think um, that's also the spectrum in which this whole field will develop in, because it will develop in the bad directions, it will develop in the good directions, and it's about finding the middle ground and um, emphasizing the strength of the technology that you mentioned, while still like minimizing the risks. Um, and this could be done by regulatory frameworks, but you have to be careful, because regulatory frameworks um, at least on a global level, um, they have to be quite wide because when you get really yep. concrete, you, you just kill a technology maybe, or you, you, you won't kill the technology, but you will, um, you will um, yeah, put it in a, in a direction that you don't want it to. Mm. That is, that's not a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you say this is bad and you're going to regulate it down, it's going to be bad. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think um, it's about finding the middle ground. It's about, um, we mentioned a lot of things. We mentioned a lot about media. We mentioned a lot about journalism. I think it's about finding the, the right mindset to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Katrina, do you think how, yeah, how hard will it be to, to find this middle ground? To first not destroy the technology side and to second not yeah, like influence the media side mm. too much? To be honest, not too hard. Um, because if you think about any technology, any technology has these kinds of sides, right? It's good and bad. And with the advent of the internet, I mean, we, if I think about, there was like a scientist that was predicting the future, and he was saying, "Oh, the internet will never persist because it's not a place where people meet." And then, boom! All these companies came and showed a different way, um, and like he was like really demonizing the internet back then, how it will be the end of communication. And I feel the kind of very similar narrative comes now into play with deepfakes because it's in a field of artificial intelligence. And if we think about what stories are we told about artificial intelligence, they're usually some sort of sci-fi movies which always show a dystopian side of how it's going to turn out. And I'm also not a huge fan of like um, being too um, euphoric, basically, about a technology, but I'm also not on the side of saying, okay, this is going to be the doom of us all. Because if you also think about primitive tools that we used, the primitive technology, we used stuff to hunt, which was great, so we could survive. But at the same time, the stuff we used to hunt is something that you can kill people with. So it has these two sides. And I think it's the same for technology. And we should just start um, understanding, like in a, in a, on the public level, on a societal level, basically, that it's not out there to harm us in the first place. Um, but in case someone thinks of uh, ways to harm us, we need to find ways to uh, protect ourselves from it. Basti, what are you thinking about it? <laughs> um, <laughs> about the points Katrina mentioned, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
actually, um, I, I totally agree with Katrina on that because um, yeah, it's a lot about finding the right way. Of course, I mentioned it. Um, but it's also about, um, you know, technology always um, change the way we as a society live. That, that's, that's the nature of technology, basically, because we, we think in different categories. We start to think in different ways. We start to create different things. Um, we create videos on our own, sitting at home, uh, with with different faces on it. It's, it's, it's great. Um, it could be great. It could be also really bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, that, that's one way to see it. Um, and I think, you know, we we have to we we have to be ready for when when shit gets done. Like when when shit gets like hell gets on earth, <laughs> we have to be ready. But we also have to be ready to emphasize, as I mentioned, to emphasize it and to be like, okay, because it's always the people that, that drive something in a direction, that drive a technology in a direction. Yep. It's it's us now. It's on us to decide what we create with it. When when we think about deepfakes, as you mentioned, the name deepfake um, and the the origin of of the word deepfake is. Uh, yeah, deep fake porn sort of, yep. but uh, and that, that's that's a bad starting point. <laughs> um, so um, that that's that's already like it, it's turned in the wrong direction, as, as so to say. The word deep fake, but when you think about synthetic media, like that, that's a different direction. Mm. So um, I think like as I mentioned, you have to find the way like that combines these things to find a middle ground. Yeah. Okay, so maybe Katrina, one last sentence for the end because we are talking like fifty two. Minutes now, we should come to an end. Um, in one sentence, probably, uh, how will be the world in the future with deepfakes? Better or worse? Is to be seen. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. Right. Sebastian, what's your opinion? Yes, as well. In the middle. <laughs> as well. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle. Okay. So I think, um, yeah, we will end this uh, talk now. So thank you very much, Katerina, um, that you were here. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And uh, I want to thank all your viewers. And um, next week, Thursday, we will go online with our um, project, the Deepfake Project, uh, the Deepfake Report. You will see it on www.deepfake.report. And I hope you will all visit the website. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.